previously on the Soundless Cinema. Mortis and Thorn are part of this game to find a gift for the Marquis, and the winner will be decided once we reach the surface again. The winner is the one that the Marquis will bind himself to. Now that we are alone, uh, away from Mortis, I was wondering if you had any ideas of the sorts of gifts that you wanted to give the Marquis. Any hints? Maybe the Druid has very interesting things, experiments and things like that. Uh, Methuselah, I'm sure you're thinking the same thing as me. We can't let the Marquis get that tree, right? Is anyone strong enough to stand up against the Marquis? It's, it's Mortis. I fear that my crisis of faith has damaged my abilities. In the battles we've faced since the incident, my powers have been less effective. Back in that pit where we encountered the Shadow Fell, I called on the power of the gods, and yet my holy smite was not strong enough to destroy the undead who attacked. Throughout the vastness of the multiverse, there lies a tavern. As you approach its doors, you catch bubbles of laughter that rise and burst into cheers as colorful groups of travelers find comfort in their bonds. As you head inside, the smile of the tavern keeper greets you. They're an otherworldly being with a bluish corporeal form. They wear attire befitting of an innkeeper, and they have a large cloudy nebula for hair speckled with stars, which gently sways with their movement. Welcome to the Storytellers Tavern, where stories are served like ale and a seat is open for you at every table. Tonight's special is the Sunless Citadel, an epic adventure of high fantasy with notes of friendship, danger, and most importantly, hope. Will our adventure survive to descend into the dungeon? Or is there a dark and calamity taking root far from the sun's reach? You guys finally get up from the rest and decide to proceed forward. As we get up, I'm going to say to Erky, Uh, Erky, could you please wake up the others? Uh, sure. I, I can do that. I just want to speak with Mortis for a moment. Oh, okay then. Proceed. And Erky goes to wake up one at a time. Well, I know it's been difficult as of late, considering all the things that have happened. It has been a trial lately. But we will get through it. I know that when I'm feeling sad, being around friends, and and that's done a lot for me. So I was wondering, once we finish going through the Sunless Citadel, I was wondering if you wanted to join up with me and Chrysantha after all of this. I know that she would want to meet you. I was going to, you know, play her the song that I made, but I think that it would make quite the impression if you two were to meet. There's a lot for you two to bond over, both of you being stalwart heroes and all. Mortis pauses for a second, and he has a noticeable look of surprise on his face. I'd have to think over such a thing, especially considering the future and my own fate. If all goes according to plan, and whether I am to win the Marquis' game, I would not want to subject you or Chrysantha to the evil of Sadolin. I want to say yes, but I must consider the risks. That is fair. I will say, as someone who's suffered in the past, you might think that that's the right thing to do, but it might be better to be around friends, especially considering that if the Marquis does take control in some way over you, that you might need people to hold you accountable, to protect you if anything goes wrong. But we've been talking a lot about saving Thorn, but I think that this sort of thing will not happen to you. We will help you, your family. My friend, I am truly thankful for your offer. I will not sacrifice one friend to save another. Be that as it may, let us get through this before we see where that goes. Slowly, Erky approaches Seeker to wake them up, and then later Thorn. That gave enough time for the Fuzla and Mortis to have their conversation. All right, friends, where should we go from here? Look, I, I know that we're supposed to be cautious as things are only getting more and more dangerous, but I don't think I can handle being in here any longer. I need to find my sister and I... 
we need to move forward. Let's go to the door with the ladder. Going up to the ladder area, you guys do see the set of the doors that is half submerged, with one of them open, just enough for you guys to squeeze. But instead of having the drop, the 10 feet drop like there was with the Shadowfell room, there is a ladder that allows you guys to climb down safely into the area. Mortis is gonna look down. Hmm, it's pitch black down there. And he turns to Methuselah. Would you be able to do what you did before with your mage hand, perhaps, as we're climbing? Yes, I suppose I could do that. Mortis then walks up to Methuselah and hands him uh, the Lantern of Luxair again. I'll extend my hand, gliding it into the room to illuminate it. The lantern descends with the flowing hand of Methuselah. The immediate area, revealing the solid and rocky surface on the ground below to be empty. Of course, that is based on what you can see from your angle and the opening of the door. What do you guys do next? Or just look to the rest of the group. I could go down first, if that's okay with the rest of you. I can go next, I suppose. Thor nods. Yes, yes, let's go. And with that, Mortis is gonna proceed with climbing down the ladder. Once you're down, you are able to see limited by the lantern, because this room is bigger than what the lantern is able to shed, but it's still, like, empty. Immediately looking around you, you do notice, though, the frame of a door. He's gonna look up and he's gonna try to yell whisper. <laughs> it, it doesn't make sense, but that's just in his head. There doesn't seem to be anything down here. Just a door forward. What what does the room look like down there? Closest thing you can think of is where the Shadowfell portal was. You then hypothesize to the best of your abilities that it might have served the same purposes as the others. According to what Methuselah said, this was an interior garden of sorts. From what I can tell, it seems to be another section of the garden, similar to what we've seen before. All right. Well, is there a way forward? Uh, there is this door. Methuselah is going to come down much slower. As Methuselah is going down, Seeker is going to look at their friend. You can do it, Methuselah. I believe in you. You've got this. Thank you, I suppose. I mean, it's just a ladder. I've gone down many of them. Well, that's true, but also, I just like encouraging you because you always encourage us. Thank you. I really appreciate that, my friend. Then I'll go down the ladder. Slowly, one at a time, you guys finally make your way down to the room. Once we're all down, Mrs. Lowe retrieves their mage hand. Moses is going to walk up to them. Would you like me to light the way? Yes, of course, and I'll give you back the lantern. Thank you, my friend. Shall we proceed, then? Let's go. In this room, there's just the door, right? Basically, yes. Well, should we continue forward? Let's go. You open a door to a hallway, which proceeds for a few feet until it opens up to a large room, with what seems to be a massive cave-in. Looking around you, you see what seems to be this ornate of sorts room, with depictions of regalia that would suggest that this place is a place of high decorum. What fixates Methuselah's attention is a stage at the very center. This stage has carvings that depict dragons of light, or panels maybe of the same dragon, doing different activities. Another thing catches your attention, for at the very center of this stage, made of stone, a great sword that is embedded into the stone of the stage of beautiful craftsmanship. Aged and rusted by time, but you're still able to realize how beautifully made must have been a great sword that you have seen, Methuselah. Can I do a roll to see what that was? Do with advantage. That's a nine. You don't remember exactly what or who but the vision of what seems to be golden wings brandishing a sword flashes in your mind before you go. I've, I've seen that over there before. I can't remember where, but it's very important. Mortis will walk over cautiously to inspect the blade. Approaching the stand, you can see the blade was well crafted. Something you'd see a royal wearing. And maybe like a very decorated general, but 
it has clearly been punished by age, by dust, by rust. Only one thing, and I would say because of your passive perception, catches your eye at this close proximity. Small red glow on one of the gems on its hilt. It's untouched by time and has a little glow of its own. You also notice that the sword is not only embedded to the stone stage, there is also a smaller stone pedestal that the blade is deeply embedded into. I'm gonna approach the sword with Mortis as well. Now that I gotta look closer, can I re-roll my check and get more information on the sword? Sure you can. 15. Upon closing the investigation, you actually remember the strong arms of your savior brandishing that sword with her gold feathered wings soaring straight to battle. This is gonna realize this and say, this was the Lakaris sword. It belonged to her, the warrior who saved me. Mortis is going to incite Methuselah saying that. He vaguely remembers the name Valakaris. Go right ahead. That's an 18. You can tell that Methuselah is being genuine. Valakaris, as in the god. I've heard her being called a goddess, but in my memories she's just a dragonborn. Who knows, maybe she was a goddess back then too. Fascinating. I remember back in the beginning of our quest into the Citadel, uh, you were playing a song about Valakaris and her deeds, although I thought it was based on her legends. You are telling me that you actually met her? Yes, she she's the one who saved me from the Dark Warden. She killed the Dark Warden that night as well. I, I led her to the creature's garden, you know, the same one that we're going to, where she killed the vile dragon. Oh, I suppose this is a sort of shrine in her memory. How odd to have it in a place like this, not to mention leaving such an artifact behind. Yes, I suppose so. There's a, a description here in Draconic. Let me read it first. You read the following. They who hold my sword in the righteous path know the Valentaris strength you fall. So the room is a shrine or is it a different kind of room? There are aspects of this room that would very well be used for idolization, such as the masterfully carved bronze panels on this stone platform depicts what you have already been told to be the Dark Warden in various moments of conquest, of subjugation onto his servants and subjects. And there is other things to indicate that the positioning, how this altar seems to be placed in an area that is meant for what you could imagine, a large group of people, an audience to attend in front of the altar. And what seems to be the weirdest thing to you is that with the light of the lantern, you look and you see that there is this large circular opening that is now blocked off by some sort of cave-in. Onto this large circular opening, there are massive engravings and imagery of dragons bowing and revering the circle, or whatever was supposed to go through it. This opening is large enough for a giant creature to go through, although you see some distinguishing iconography and art that would imply a religious undertone. Your gut feeling gives you the impression that this is more than just a religious room. Well, it seems like... This is quite the sword. Incredible. I have heard of blades like this only in legends. This elegant blade should not be left to rust. If anyone's worthy of the blade, it's you. Velikaris was meant to uplift and protect others. She seemed to want to take down the dragons that enslaved and tormented and subjugated so many people. You know, she was a defender of good, ultimately. A missed opportunity not to take it, in the hopes that somehow it might help us. Sheepishly, Mortis walks up to the blade, uh, grip it with both of his hands and try to pull it out of the pedestal. 
you ascend on top of the stage, you have to lift with your arms to be able, because it's quite a big stage per se. Upon arriving in front of the blade, you see it is embedded onto this pedestal, but it's not embedded in the sense that it has a place for it there. It was forcibly placed onto this area. You grab on it to a hold of the hilt, and just by holding it, it is firm. You have the impression this is going to take a lot of strength to pull out. Thorn is going to see Mortis go up to the sword. And as Mortis is looking it over, Thorn would notice a little flash of doubt in Mortis's eyes as this blade is so deeply embedded in the rock. And he places his own hands above Mortis's hands with a big grin. And then he looks to Seeker and Methuselah and starts waving them over to come help too with the sword. Seeker is going to follow, and they're going to also put one of their paws over Mortis's hand. Uh, Mortis, you're the strongest person I've ever met. I was going to say strongest turtle, but you're the only turtle I've ever met, so I figured calling you the strongest person I've ever met is kinder. It's still accurate. I I've met a lot of people, but only one turtle. And that's you. And then Methuselah, since, you know, they're not going to be much help in terms of strength, they're going to play on Yorick, the song of Alucares, but they're going to change it up and meld in the song that they had made for Mortis and combine them in this very heroic thing. Yes, like, look at the heroes who are on the same sort of pedestal as these very strong people in Methuselah's memory and I'm going to obviously give you bardic inspiration for this. For the first time in what seems like days, genuine, unrestrained smile crosses Mortis's face. Thank you all for believing in me. Well then, together, as one. So my base check is 25. <laughs> Damn! Uh, and adding four from Seeker is going to be 29. <laughs> And add three from Thorn. So 32. 25 was the DC. Hey. Hey. Of course I caught it without. You did it on your own! Yeah. yeah. It's narratively a thing. His arc. It is still an old sword. It's still very damaged by age. But you do feel a certain power within it. The dragon eye gem lights up a little bit more. And then within you you feel a warmth of sorts. The rust starts to diminish, as if it was a wind just pushing aside. And before you know it, the gleam of the blade glistens against the light of the lantern. As he holds the legendary blade in his hand, a look of satisfaction crosses Mortis's face. I don't know why, but I feel different holding this weapon complete. It's the coolness, the coolness sleeping into Mortis's bones. I think it suits you, Mortis. Well, here, give it a couple swings just to try it out. Mortis takes a wide stance and swings the blade through the air. Swing flies through, the air being cut by the blade. It feels strong. There's a certain glow on the blade as you swing. Mid-swing, it's something that it's not noticeable when still, but in motion, it does feel like there's a glow. And it, some could swear that they have noticed glints of fire starting as the blade is in motion. I don't know if it would feel right to keep this, but in the very least, I will safeguard it during our travels. And I'm sure you'll put it to good use against the druid. Oh, you're going to be even better in this fight now, Mortis. I know it. Maybe one day you can teach Thorns how to swing this sword. <laughs> Perhaps indeed, my friend. Mortis, although you're feeling confident about this new weapon, and that there's this certain glow on the hilt of the blade that is unnaturally comforting to you, you feel something wrong. You feel a certain drainage from you, deep within your chest, but also almost as if it was on your left shoulder as well. And it hurts 
deep within you just rotting as a total of 10 necrotic damage is afflicted on you. This feeling is from nowhere. Nothing approached you. You have not seen anything. Your overall strength is also seeped out. As right now, you lose one point of strength. After this triumphant moment, Mortis falls to one knee. <laughs> what the? Something's happening to me. Are, are you alright? Is, is there any way we can help? I'm not sure. There's a great pain in my shoulder. I look to Erky, who's the smartest person in the room. Erky <laughs> quickly tries his best to climb up to the stage. Can Seeker go and help Erky up? As you approach, he's pretty much halfway there, and then you just get him away. Erky approaches you and looks at your shoulder, and he's confused. Mortis, uh, you have some sort of cloak that is darker than your gray cloak? What, what are you talking about? Because I think either you have a scarf or s there's a black shadow on your shoulder. Is there a way that I can get up onto the stage or no? You jump up. It wasn't noticeable from this distance. But as you approach, you swear that there is what seems to be some sort of like shadow of the hand on his shoulder to chest. Is it a human hand, or does it have, like, claws? Looks humanoid. Yeah, uh, Thorn sees this, and his first reaction is to try to stomp on it. I'm so sorry, Mortis. Do, uh, do an attack roll. The six to hit. You stomp to the best of your strength, but it doesn't hit the shadow. It hits the shell beside the shadow. And as it hits the shell, you don't feel anything, because the attack is way too weak for that. Uh, what's going on here? Pointing like to like your shoulder, not really knowing what to say. As you look upon your shoulder, you do see a shadow of a hand, almost as if there was a person against the light, just imprinting a shadowy hand. And then that shadowy hand just flies backwards, as if the hand in front of a light was just taken away from the light. And then another one approaches on your other side, on your other shoulder. And as it approaches, it fixates on your on your chest again. And then you feel that same pain emanating from you. A total of nine necrotic damage is afflicted on you. Can Thor roll perception to try to see where these hands are coming from? Sure. Can I, because the only thing that has changed is the sword. So can I try to touch the sword? and see if there's like any difference in feeling by touching it. You touch the sword and you just touch metal. There's no like difference. No indication of anything different. I got an 11. You follow with your eyes the arm on the shoulder that leads to Mortis's back. And then you notice that there is a shadow as if the sword was still embedded. Can Thorn scurry down Mortis's back, cast Primal Savagery, and just attack the shadow. Go right ahead. What you guys witness is just a feral growl leave Thorn's throat as he leaps down and just starts attacking what looks to be a shadow on the ground. I got a 15 to hit. As you fall onto the ground and you growl, and with those magically glowing fangs, you start to strike the ground as you hit the ground with the shadow, the shadow vibrates, and so does the arm on Mortis's chest, reacts, and then quickly retracts, going towards the shadow, and then the shadow changes from the shape of the sword that was previously humanoid silhouette, but it's still on the ground. My hand is going to move up from the sword because I imagine Mortis is still holding it so my hand moves up because I don't know what's going on but I see that Mortis is pain and clearly losing strength and I'm going to cast Cure Wounds so as I reach and touch your forearm the hand glows in this red color and the chrysanthemums bloom up and start to heal the wounds. I'm just going to say that as Thorn did attack the shadow and I'm gonna say that the Fuselis thing happened pretty much at the same time. Before anything else takes place, 
I'd like you guys to roll for initiative. of this episode of the Sunless Citadel. Thank you so much for listening. Subscribe to us on whatever app you use to listen to podcasts and be sure to catch the next installment of the Sunless Citadel every Thursday at 12pm EST. If you like the show, please consider leaving a review. It's a small way to show your support that goes a long way. To connect with us, follow our social media accounts, and if you'd like to support us, you can head over to our Patreon to join the conversation, view sneak peeks of our next project, and discover our fantastic bonus content. Our intro score was created by Patrick Corton from Off the Beaten Path Musical. The Sunless Citadel can be found in the Tales from the Yawning Portal by Wizards of the Coast. The world of Nasso Mundus was created by Pedro Stockler. Thanks again for listening from all of us at the Storytellers Tavern. Thank you.